towards the end of today's lesson, we're going to look at banks. Now, I'm going to ask for a volunteer from the audience because I'm, I'm going to give you two systems. One involves your imagination, almost an artistic flair. The other one is more calculated. But I'm going to give you two options to learn how to do good things. Uh, last week, there's one thing I want you to remember. We covered a perfect stroke. Now, when I think of a, a perfect stroke, the first thing that comes to my mind is a stop shot. And I know I've been emphasizing that, but a stop shot is by far the most important shot in the pool. And I think you're, you're beginning to realize that because when you, when you can execute a stop shot from various distances, you're, you're actually developing a very powerful stroke. Not only that, you're setting the foundation for playing position play from that point on. Now, when you hit a stop shot from an angle on a cut shot, that stop shot will be skidding into the object ball and will always take a perfect 90 degree tangent line. So on any shot where you have to cut a ball in any direction, you can actually determine exactly where the cue ball is going to end up. So here's a good chance to review all the things we've learned so far. But every day, ideally, you should shoot maybe 10 or 20 stop shots and shoot them from different distances. Let me give you two really good examples. Like we'll start with the 14, and we can kind of go through our checklist real quick. First thing, breathe and relax, visualize the shot. Chin, cue, and right toe all on that target line. Swing down into the shot, everything looks good. Take your nice warm-up strokes, just like you're rehearsing the shot. Draw back slowly, let the cue go all the way through until you hear the sound of the ball hitting the pocket. You know, make that 10 times and then go back a little bit. Move your cue ball back a foot and a half or so, another stop shot. And you'll notice on this stop shot, it's a little different. You're going to have to hit the cue, cue ball a little bit lower, aren't you? And you're also going to have to use more stroke, which means a longer pendulum back and longer follow through. That's what creates power. Power is not created by your muscles and your shoulders. A stroke is, is the best way to describe it is if you have a spear in your hand and you're throwing that spear under you. How it releases naturally to the ball. The most important thing about a stroke is that the Q-tip accelerates through the cue ball. You don't waste all your power back here going to the cue ball. The acceleration is through the cue. That's real important. But this is a good stop shot that Bert Kinister made famous. Do all of our checklists, swing down, take your warm up strokes, stay down until you hear the ball go in the pocket. Okay, uh, I've got another stroke builder for you. And this one is really challenging. If you, if you have an you know, hour or two to practice this, I just found out that the five-time world snooker champion, Steve Davis, used to shoot this shot for an hour every day, you know, practicing snooker, which is a much more challenging game than pool. But the idea here is to practice, practice your setup and stance, and I'm going to aim for the center of that nameplate down there, and I'm going to stroke right through the cue ball, and the idea is to have the cue ball come back, and I'm going to follow through, and hopefully the cue ball hit the tip of my which will designate a perfect stroke. And you'll notice I always use the spot. The spot is a way of diagnosing stroke problems. Did the tip end up over here, over here, up in the air? It should go straight through and land on the belt. This is a tough one. <laughs> Swing down, draw your warm-ups just like normal. Go straight through the cue ball. You really can't get a feel for how hard this is until you practice it for a while. Just that hair one side or the other will take you off. Try it one more time. That's better. Now you can just practice that you know, a few times each day and that really will indicate whether or not your stroke is on or not. Okay, another thing that we haven't really talked about in the class so far that's really important is you absolutely, to be a good player, have to know where the center of the pocket is. 
and it varies depending on the angle you're shooting at the puck. Let's take, for example, the 14 ball in the corner with the cue ball here. This is one of the most commonly missed shots in pool. The reason is that most people, when they aim this shot, they're shooting for the center of the pocket they, they think is right here. In reality, if I aim for this spot, the 14 ball is going to hit the rail and go like this and bring it up. So ideally, the center of the pocket on a cut shot from that angle is actually to this side of the pocket. And there's another factor too that enters, enters in. <coughs> when you cut a ball, you're actually putting English on the ball. In other words, when I hit the 14, I'm putting left to right English, which will push the ball down just slightly. And also there's friction between the cue ball and the 14 ball, and that friction will sometimes grab for a moment and push the ball down. So on these shots like this, you have to slightly overcut, slightly overcut. Swing down, all your warm-ups. down. And you notice that ball went into the professional side of the pocket. This is the amateur side. And I know you're probably sick of hearing that, but that's, to be a good pool player, you really have to, you know, know where the pockets are. Same thing on this shot. Where is the center of the pocket on this shot, shooting at five in the corner? What would you say? <coughs> Halfway there, <coughs> between that point <coughs> right here. Right, exactly. This it would it would be in this side of the pocket. And again, when I when I uh, find my aim point and find my target line, it would be to hit the ball to this side of the pocket. Because if I hit that knuckle on the on the pocket there, it's gonna hang up every time. Especially in country roads, right? <laughs> Swing down. And you notice how that one caught pretty far over to this side. That's okay. It'll always go in. But if you hit this part of the pocket, it's going to hang up. Okay? Any questions on any of that? Okay. When, when we shoot, should we always try to shoot for the professional side? Well, uh, <laughs> the professional side is going to vary depending on the shot. For example, there is no professional side to this shot. The special side is dead center in the middle because the pocket is facing directly at you. And snooker is a completely different story. I'm, I'm not even going to comment on that. <laughs> but yeah, let's, we'll, we'll talk about that. That's a good point. Okay, uh, we're ready for basic position. Okay. Now, when I think of position play, the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, you got simply have to get angles. Straight in is not good. The reason why straight in is not so good is because it eliminates all your options. It's using the cue ball to get position. Let me give you a quick example of why you always want to get angles. We'll take a game of eight ball, and I'll put the five ball here, the four ball here, and the eight out to the center of the table. Now, when a good player is playing position, here's what they are actually thinking. They're thinking, well, when I make the four, what side of the five ball do I have to get on so I can get perfect shape on the eight ball? In other words, at least three balls ahead all the time. And top professionals even go further than that. But a lot of people on this shot would do something foolish like this. They might do something like this, and I'll just get up stop shot. Now why was that so bad? Because you can't do nothing for it. Yeah, now you have to go draw it back or do some fancy English shot to get position. Mm -hmm. So when you're shooting any shot in 8 ball or 9 ball or whatever game, you simply need to know which side of the ball you need to be on to get position for the next ball. So the correct way to do this is simply to roll a little bit straight forward so I have an angle on the five. And what we call that is natural position to the eight. 
Now when I cut the five in, the tangent line is here, and the cue ball is going up right behind the eight. And you can see it's almost unmissable from, from that position. probably wondering what these silly little dots on the table are for. Uh, what I'm going to use these for is a, a basic drill. This is drill number one. And I think you'll find this interesting. We talked a little bit about it last time. But when you're playing good position, the first thing that you consider or think about, and I'm not going to put the balls on the table because I just want you to get a feel for the shot first. The first thing I look at when I think about playing position is where's the tangent line? You always look at that first. The tangent line is exactly 90 degrees. You draw a line to the center of the pocket for the contact point, and the tangent line is 90 degrees. So it should hit the rail right there if I hit a stop shot. Remember, a stop shot, the cue ball will be skidding to this point and then take that perfect 90 degree angle. And just experiment, see where the cue ball goes. If it hits there, where's it going to end up? Probably right to that second diamond, full force. Perfectly dead center, stroke right through it. Pretty close. Okay, now let's do the same thing, but this time we're going to change the tangent line. So this is going to hit a high rolling ball with follow. Anybody want to guess where the cue ball is going to go? Let's see. Let's find out. It's got to be short of that. What's that? It's got to be farther down there. I oh, there yeah. Was one, uh, yeah. There was one thing I was going to ask. I didn't mind this the first lesson, but you were talking about the tangent line, and then uh, top shortens it up, and uh, bottom pulls it away. Right. But um, I think the point I wanted to make sure was made was that it always starts on the tangent line and then curves from That's there. That's absolutely true. true. Time is right on. No matter how you hit the cue ball, it will start out on the tangent line. If you hit it real slow, it won't last long on that tangent line because it'll probably roll forward because it's a rolling ball. But time is absolutely right about that. It starts on the tangent line, but then it changes. For example, I'm going to hit high ball with a rolling forward motion, and we'll see where the cue ball ends up. Pretty much at this diamond or close to it. So look, we just hit a uh, stop shot, and the cue ball was three diamonds different compared to a follow shot. Now let's look at it from a draw shot. And you might think right now, well, I wonder where the cue ball is going to go. This is how you learn position play. It should go somewhere approximately around this diamond with draw, because with follow, we change the tangent line forward. With draw, it's going to go behind a little bit. Oh, wow. I stroked that too good. <laughs> 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 All right. But you showed and how it took off yeah. down the tangent line and then started spinning off. Exactly. And speed will affect that will affect that. In other words, that had time, even before it got to the tangent line, to take the English that you saw it hit way up here. That's how much you can change the tangent line with draw or follow. Let's try that one more time. I won't use so much English. Well, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah. Now you were going yeah. about two tips lower, right? Yeah. But it, it, Really, when you get down to two tips below center, you're, you're on the borderline. I'd say more like a tip and a half. I'm being careful. Yeah. But this is, uh, you know, a really important part of the game, just to practice, you know, where the tangent line is on a shot. In fact, uh, one of the drills that I'll do oftentimes is I'll set two balls like this, a cue ball and an object ball, and I'll put the next ball and just throw it on the table anywhere, and then I'll figure out how to get position for that ball. That's how you learn the cue ball. Okay, the next next drill I want to do.
Drill number two is we're actually going to use English. But before I actually throw in English into this shot, I want to show you what the limits and the applications are of English. So we'll put the cue ball back in the spot and we'll experiment. The first shot I'm going to do is I'm going to go for the center of the nameplate down there with a half a tip of left English. And we'll see where the cue ball goes. There's center with a half tip over. And that's pretty much expected anywhere between this dot in the pocket. Now a full tip of English is going to change it even more. Well, there's straight in the center, full Q-tip of left English. And that's pretty much right at the pocket. Okay. Now let's try a tip and a half. Tip and a half of English. Straight, one tip, tip and a half. Usually somewhere around the second diamond. Now we'll, we'll push the envelope here. We'll go to two tips of left English. Approximately should go right around the side pocket. And close. Now uh, the thing I wanted to alert you to on that is look at the difference. Half a tip, one tip, tip and a half, two tips. That's quite a variation too. So, so you can appreciate how much you can actually accomplish using English, how much you can change, you know, the uh, action of the cue ball. Yeah. Question on that. I, I noticed that when we're using English like you were doing there, yeah. uh, to the left. Now, is it, for me sometimes it pushes the cue ball off. Oh, I'm okay. so glad you brought that up. Time. That was actually the next. That was actually the next thing that we're going to oh, talk okay. about. But that's fine. That's great. Uh, as as Doug just mentioned, when you use English, it is always a last resort. Now, when I say English, I don't mean low or high. I mean hitting the cue ball on the left side or the right side, whether it's high left, low left, high right, low right. The reason why it's a last resort is because the cue ball will do two things when you use English. One, when you hit the side of the ball, for example, the left side of the cue ball, it's going to deflect slightly to the right. Exactly. That's called deflection. But also, it does another thing. If you hit it slow or medium speed with left English, it will slightly deflect, but it'll curve slightly back. So uh, that's why English creates uh, you know, a lot of frustration for a lot of people, because they don't know how to compensate. And that's something you know I can help you with, you know, in this class. But one of the things you never want to do when you're using English is fire the ball, because you're talking, you know, uh, immense deflection. You're, you probably won't even get close to the cue ball. When I use English, I try to keep a really smooth stroke, you know, and keep the cue stick level. If you elevate and use English, you're actually looking at a masse or a swerve, as they call it, and that's that's inviting problems. Only professional players do that when they want to do fancy stuff, you know. But let's look at a few applications of English and uh, why you'd want to use it. For example, let's take uh, a shot like this. The eight ball is right over here. And we have our cue ball and object ball in the same place. Let's say uh, these are the last two balls on the table and I want to get position right here. Well, if I use a normal high ball, I'll end up over here and I've got a little bit longer shot. What if I want to get it right here? I would use a full Q-tip of left English and just gently hit enough speed to hit the rail and come back to here. One Q-tip of left English. And you can see I have a hanger, a real easy shot. Let's take another shot. Let's say the eight ball is down here. We'll put the six ball on the spot here and move the cue ball slightly so I have a thinner cut. All right, uh, if I hit center ball in this, or even a, a, you know, a stop shot, 
I'm going to end up somewhere up here and I might bounce out where I have a very difficult shot. So ideally, where I want the cue ball to come in is somewhere in this location, so it'll slide right down behind the eight ball. So on this shot, I would use one Q-tip of right angle. And you see, the uh, reason why that's so important is you notice the ball came hit the rail and went into the line of the next shot. Look at how much room for error I had. Anywhere from here all the way to here, I could, would have had an easy shot in the eight ball. Okay. But like, you saw how gently I hit it that time? When you hit it like I just hit it, you don't have to worry about compensation. Because if you hit a nice smooth stroke with a level Q, uh, even though it may deflect slightly, it will you know, hopefully curve back enough to where you don't have to change your aim so drastically. But, for example, if you have a shot like this, it's a horse of a different color. Let's say that I have the shot at the 7 and I want to get position on the 8 ball. You know what? I've got to use a lot of stroke on this and I've got to use a lot of pendulum. So uh, on this shot, I'm going to really have to compensate for the deflection. So basically, I'm going to shoot the seven more for this side of the pocket, because I'm going to use a lot, of, a lot of stroke and a lot of force. When I'm using that much left English to go one, two, three rail behind the eight, I'm going to get some deflection. If I hit the left side of the ball, it will deflect to the right. Let me show you real quick. You don't have to force this. You want to make your stroke nice and smooth. Nice level cue. And that's exactly what I wanted to do. I could have hit a lot more force, but uh, using that amount of English, I had to compensate by aiming the ball heavier to this side of the pocket compensate for the deflection of the cue ball. You know, that's a pretty advanced idea, but it's, it's still important. All right, let's, uh, let's go on with some other stuff. We're going to hit banks today. I know everybody's interested in that. But one of the things I want to do uh, uh, is to give you a couple of drills. And I consider these probably one of the best drills that I've ever seen in pool. And I, I would encourage everybody to practice these on a daily basis better. And there's many variations. First, let's start with a L drill with three balls. Now, on this one, to start out, we're going to just take ball in hand on the spot, and we're going we're gonna to make all three balls. But after we make the first ball, we can ball in hand as we can make all three. So I'll start out with a normal stop shot. Okay. Then I'll move the cue ball back on the spot. And then I'm going to shoot the four ball. And this is a good chance to practice for the center of the pocket because we know it's a little bit to the left side. So then I'll shoot the four ball in the corner. Put the ball back on the spot and then shoot the one ball. It's great practice on your cut shots and stop shots. Now that's the first part of the drill. Once you master that, once you can do that, the next phase of the drill, you're going to take ball in hand on the first shot, but then you're going to play position to run all three balls. So you might put it at a slight angle like this and draw it back so you have a nice angle on the six so you can get to the three. In other words, you're thinking about how to play position. And you see, I got a perfect angle so I can come across here and, and get right behind the three. And again, you want to make sure you're hitting in the center of the pocket. This is a great drill for improving your game. Now, the, the third iteration of this drill is now you make them in rotation. <laughs> So the first shot, 
You set up position on the three to get on the six to get on the seven. And you think about exactly what you're doing. On this shot, I'm thinking I need to get on this side of the six so I can get to the seven. This one I need to draw back to slightly so I have a nice shot on the seven. Notice I'm staying down until I hear the ball hit the back of the pocket. And then eventually you can even do, I think uh, John Mark mentioned this, you can start on one side and play position for the next ball and the next ball. But like everything else, it becomes more complicated. So let's move the ball down a little bit. <coughs> this time we're going to use five balls. And it actually goes up to, to using 10 balls, you know, when it becomes very, very challenging. And I won't do all this, I'll just kind of demonstrate a few shots, but on this first one, you move the cue ball slightly back, and you'll make all five balls and take ball in hand each time, practicing those cut shots and the stop shots. Then the next drill, you'll take ball in hand, and you'll just try to run out. You'll try to run all five balls. And then eventually you'll get to the point where, well, darn, I'm getting good. I'm going to make all the rotation. And you'll play uh, from the one to the three to the five to the six to the seven. So you can see, you know, it really is a chance to really apply everything we've learned in this class. Okay. Eventually, this is the one I practice. I'll put five balls down the middle and five over here. And I'll, I'll, I'll practice that same drill. But let me show you how this five ball drill works. Let's just try to make them in rotation. This first shot, I need to get on this side of the three so I can get to the five. So I'll hit a little bit of a draw shot. On, there. When you say on this side, what do you mean? On this, what, on this on side the of the three so I can get to the five next. Your, your uh, the, the this side means anywhere this side of this line, right? Right, anywhere you, this side of that line. <coughs> or there are other ways I could have done it. I could have left it on this side, but it's a little bit harder. I don't want to, if you collide with another ball, or you miss a ball, you have to start over. Okay? <laughs> so you, you have to keep going so you can accomplish it. This one, I'll go ahead and play the three and get position on the five so I can get on the six. And that was just about perfect. Now I can cut the five in and come out to the center of the table so I can get on the six to get to the seven. And this one, I'm going to need a little right English. I don't want to bump into the seven. I need to come up to here. You can kind of see how you learn everything. You get to try almost every aspect of hockey when you're doing those drills. And I have them pretty well explained in the handout if you want to try those. All right, we finally got there. We're ready for banks. Now, uh, can I get a volunteer? Because this is a, the first system that I want to show you is, is, a, is a slightly complicated. Can I get a volunteer to come out that wants to really learn this? Jim, all right, cool. <laughs> well, everybody jump along. <laughs> they know what happens when you volunteer around here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all, right. all right. The reason why I want to get a volunteer is that I, act, I, I have to admit I've had trouble explaining this. I was trying to explain it to Claudia, and she kept looking at me like, like I was from Mars. <laughs> so so I, I tried to turn it into what I call a three-step thing only three steps you have to keep in mind. And keep in mind that the first bank we're going to shoot is a straight bank, which means you're shooting the, the object ball fairly straight. Okay. When you get into cut banks, we have to cut the object ball. That's a little bit different if we'll get into that. But here's a basic uh, straight bank where we're banking into the side pocket. But the first step uh, on this system that's taught by uh, Dr. Q, Tom Rossman, is you simply find the midpoint between the object ball and the pocket you're trying to make an entry. So to find the midpoint, I'll lay my cue out here, 
and guesstimate where that midpoint is. And that looks about right, doesn't it, Terry? All right. The second step is you lay your cue across that midpoint to the opposite pocket on the other side of the table. That's step two. The last step is that you simply have to hit the seven ball on an exact parallel line. So in order to calculate where to hit the rail with the seven, you simply lift up your cue, move it over here, and hit it on a parallel line. So if I hit the seven into the rail at that point, I should most undoubtedly make it in the side pocket. Now Jim gets a turn. <laughs> All right, I'll set up the same shot. And the first thing I want Jim to do is to find the midpoint. So we look at the pocket we're going to bank into in the object ball, and we just lay our cue across. That's it. And now put your, your left forefinger in the midpoint between the seven ball and the pocket. Probably somewhere in this area. Oh, right? midpoint. Midpoint, yeah. Okay. Oh, between yeah. the pocket. Yeah, pocket. between the seven ball and the pocket. You got it. All right, that's step number one. Step number two is now you, you keep your finger on the midpoint, right on the table. Keep your finger oh, on the right. table. Yeah. Okay. Now turn the cue to the opposite side pocket. That's step two. Midpoint. Okay. Now step three is you hit the seven ball on exact parallel. Three steps. And usually a firm hit will help. Beautiful. Push five, to five, right? <laughs> <Get it. laughs> now, um, question. Did that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you hit that like perfect. That, that <laughs> split the wicket, didn't it? I was praying. <laughs> no, any questions on that? That's the basic system that I've used for a long time. But the second one that I'm going to show you, I think, is even better than that one. Because for me and for a lot of people, you don't really want to go through all those machinations when you shoot a shot. Like, I use that system generally, but I don't lay my cue on the table or anything. I just see the midpoint from where I'm standing. I imagine a cue across to the uh, opposite pocket, and then I see the parallel line. I don't really actually calculate it by putting the cue on the table. But you got to that point by doing that, by putting it on the table first? It's a great that starting happens? point. It's a great starting point. But the thing is, banking is artistic. Banking is an artistic endeavor because there's so many variables. The speed, the English, the table, the cloth. In other words, eventually you just get a feel for how to bank a shot. Now, uh, let's, let's take a, a cut bank, for example. Let's say the cue ball is over on this side of the six ball. You know what? You can calculate this bank the same way. Find the midpoint between the pocket and the six ball. Lay the cue across the opposite side pocket, lift it up, and hit it on a parallel line. But on this bank, we're actually cutting the six ball. So guess what? You have to slightly overcut the six ball. Because when you cut an object ball, it puts English on the ball. So it puts uh, uh, left to right English. So when it hits the rail, if I hit it normally, it'll come back a little short. So on a cut bank, you actually have to overcut it slightly. So on this shot, let's, let's do the system. Midpoint, parallel line, but I'm gonna slightly overcut it. See, see how it held up? That cut, the act of cutting the ball actually puts English on the object. So in this particular cut bank, you have to overcut it slightly. Let me find my dot, cross to the corner pocket, parallel line, swing down. It works, it works, it's a good system. Uh, now 
want to give you the second thing. And I think this is one that I think a lot of people use, uh, especially people that are, you know, like have a good imagination and they're more into the arts rather than, you know, mathematics and things like that. But this system is actually doing the same thing. It's bisecting an angle. But this system is basically what I'm going to do is imagine that Country Rose has another pool table flush to this pool table right up against the wall. Now, the system here is so simple, but it's very effective. All you have to do to bang the six into the side pocket here is imagine where the side pocket would be on a table that was flush against this table. So basically, it's called the mirror banking system. So I'm going to aim the six ball at an imaginary side pocket of a pool table that's flush against this table. And I think that I can even see the point on the wall where that would be approximately. And I'll get lined up to that. And it's simply a point of aiming at that spot. Okay. Has anybody ever heard of that system before or thought about it? It works phenomenally. It even works, it even works on long rail banks. Let's say I'm um, shooting the six ball, banking the six ball into this pocket. Well, what I would do is imagine a, a, a pool table vertically positioned uh, flush against this pool table, and I would imagine where the corner pocket was on the far left of that imaginary pool table. And I can see it right now where it is. And I'm going to aim the six right at that point. ball here, aim that six ball at that imaginary corner pocket, anyway it's a, it's a really good practice tool to kind of think about that, and it works from any angle, corner pockets, imagine where the corner, right where Tom is sitting, aim right at her, her, her right knee there, that's a really good point. Well, yeah. that one thing to keep in mind about banks like this, if you hit it hard, the bank will shorten up. It'll come, come this side of the pocket. If you hit it soft, it'll roll along. So speed is really an important factor. <laughs> One more time. See where that imaginary pocket is. Yeah. Other side. Yeah, I got that one. I hit a little firmer. Let's try it again. Yeah. There. And after a while, you know, every table, every equipment, every cloth has, has different qualities and characteristics. But you kind of get a feel after a while, you know, so it's uh, Any questions about banking? Hey. Yeah, go ahead. I have the hardest time doing like, like. Oh, length. The, you know, this corner, like banks and chips. Okay, let's okay. try that. Let's I don't say. Have any long and banks. <laughs> All right, the first thing you do on a bank like this, let's say we're banking into that corner pocket, and I've learned this from playing one pocket, is you start out by finding which diamonds connect. In other words, these two pockets connect to that corner pocket. These two diamonds connect to that corner pocket. These two connect, and so forth. It doesn't work very well down here because you have to use English. But on this particular shot, let's say the six and the cue ball are lined up. Now, what makes these shots so hard is that if I hit this firm and the six ball sinks into the rail, it's going to end up way short. In other words, to make this work, the six ball has to be a rolling ball to go that long. Otherwise, if you hit it firm and stroke it, it'll come up way short. Let me kind of demonstrate that without the six ball. The first shot, I'll stroke through it firmly and watch where the cue ball goes. 
with two diamonds short. But watch what happens if I hit a rolling ball. Now I'm going to have to use a little bit of right English, just a hair, and that should take me close to the point of pocket. Okay, so you're going to that diamond instead of... Well, it, it works on a parallel system. See, this, this is true. So say the balls are over here. You just parallel them. In other words, this goes in with a little right English. This would be good too. So I'm going to hit it on a parallel line like I just did into here. And that should take me right to the corner pocket with just a little English. And your parallel line was this diamond right here. Exactly. And this to diamond this here. So if you're halfway, you're halfway. Halfway, you're exactly. Okay. Exactly. Good. Now, it's a little different when you're hitting an object ball, Tanya. You have to compensate because you can't really very easily put a lot of English on the object ball. So if I had this lined up like this between these two diamonds, I would have to compensate a little bit, so I'd have to hit it a little bit right of the diamond to make it in the corner pocket. But if I hit a rolling ball, it'll take the angle, it'll lengthen the angle. If I hit it firm, it'll shorten it. Yeah. So this one I'm going to hit just a little right of that diamond with a rolling ball.
shots, but speed is crucial. Like on any of these shots, if you hit them hard, basically your chances of making them are, are a lot slimmer. Uh, even if you're up perfectly in line, like this, on the connecting diamond, you really have to hit this with a moderate speed to have a good chance of making it. I seem to be going a little long on all of them. But yeah. Any other questions? So you can use the mirror system on this shot also. You just have to compensate if it's closer to the yeah, rail. Yeah, close to the rail, you have to overcut it. Or if you're cutting it from this angle, you have to overcut it. Uh, but you can use the connecting diamond or the mirror system with another table. That's your easy way. Okay. Yeah. Like if we, if we had a table flush here, we'd be aiming at the far right corner pocket. In that same system, you're doing it from this diamond here to this diamond. That same system would work from this yeah. diamond to this diamond. But as you move further over, it, it's less effective. Because, for example, way down here, it doesn't work at all. Because watch what happens. Even if I roll it slowly, I'll, I won't get hardly to that second diamond. It doesn't work from there without using some English. But with a little right, it might. A little right, yeah. If you hit this with right English and go a little past the diamond, you can get pretty close. Mm -hmm. And that should take you right in. But as you get farther away, the diamonds are more accurate. But from here and here, they're pretty accurate. This one, if I had a ball hanging in the pocket, like the eight ball here, and I had a ball in the way like this, I could probably pretty easily make that eight ball just by using these connecting diamonds. Just a little bit of right angle. But you know, it's a complicated game when you get into kicks and bangs. There's, there's a lot of different ways to do it. But why don't we break up into groups and I'll, I'll come around and, and work on some shots. Either the banks, or you might want to try the drills, you know, using stop, follow, and draw and see how the cue ball comes off so you can control the cue ball and then try using right English or left English on that shot. That would be a good practice drill. And then if you wanted to, you could start trying the L drill, you know, starting out with three balls and then moving up to five balls. But like I said, take ball in hand the first time and then after that, try to run them out, play position for each ball, and then eventually try to make them into rotation. Okay? When you're doing yeah. mirror tables, are you counting the rails or you're just going tip the, the play, play tip, just that surface again, or the whole pool table, or? Well, uh, if we're banking at six, so I, I look at a point about four and a half feet away, which would be about right here, and I'd aim for that imaginary side pocket. But like I said, it's not a system for everybody because a lot of people don't like want something more, more solid to aim at. <laughs> You're, yeah. just, you're just basically I'm just guesstimating, guesstimating where I think the side pocket would be. And, and when you think about it, all this is doing is bisecting the angle, just like we did with this other system. But it's yet, you know, a point in space that you can't isolate. You just use your imagination. But after you've played for so many years like I have, you, you, you get a feel for it. And, you know, it's almost like, a, yeah, that's where I'm supposed to hit it. Take what works and just go yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Well, if you play on the uh, no. end, I mean, you play on the same table, or you can figure out, well, let's say you play on the same table, once you figure out where the spot is on that table, let's say, it's there every time. Yeah. I mean, it stays the same place, I think. Exactly, yeah. So. And I know you use that system. I use it. Well, yeah. I, uh, my, when I play in big cushion bears with those guys, uh, Tony would try to teach me 2700 systems, you know. All I do was say, I've got, I know where all the points are, the three rail points and the four rail points, five rail points on the wall. Yeah. From anywhere, I'm just gonna hit 
try to figure out how to get the cue ball to that point if I want to go to five rails, like it's the lock on the, <laughs> that lock over there right. from this, from anywhere here is five rails on that tape. <laughs> the, the other lock, uh, the key, the other lock is three rails. I mean, so it's there every time. And, you know, then there's a, a, something on this other side I've forgotten to them, but they'll stay the same once you figure out what they are. That's why you shouldn't play pool on their equipment table they like playing on. <laughs> I mean, if you're playing side. Yeah. But, you know, I, I just want to reemphasize that banking is an art. You know, it's not something that you can just calculate mathematically and expect to be a good banker. It's more than that. Because there is feel involved. The system gets you in the right zip code. But then from there, that's where your uh, your feel takes over because speed, English, uh, rails, the clock, all that impacts the, the way the ball rebounds off the rail. That's why banking is uh, often, you know, a last resort. You right. will often shoot a cut shot before you will, you'll shoot a bank. But with all the one pocket being played now and, and all the bank pool, it's becoming, I think, people are becoming more proficient. Oh, it's a very complex game where one player uh, competes against another, and the first person that makes all the eight balls in their pocket wins. But it's a very long game where you play a lot of safeties, and mm -hmm. it's almost like chess where you're, yeah. you're move, making moves <coughs> to put the advantage in your favor. Terry and George play a lot. Yeah, George loves one. I don't think I pointed out that's really important is, is look at the amazing difference that one Q-tip on either side will make. If I use one Q-tip on the left on this shot, I come over about between these diamonds. You know, one Q-tip of right probably takes me down pretty close to the corner pocket. Then when I, I, the ball was rolling forward, that's why it came a little short. But if I stroke this with right English, in other words, I stroke through it a little bit, it would go a lot farther. In other words, that first one, the ball was rolling, so the tangent line was shortened. That second one took the tangent line, so it came a lot further, you know, spread the angle a lot more. So let's uh, break up on the tables and try any drills you want. I'll come around and help you out. Congratulations on your goals. Oh, thanks, Betty.